brother Jim. And isn't it wonderful to know him? Amen? Well, we appreciate that great music. And thank you, Brother Bruce. Bruce says he's tired of being around preachers without passion. Well, we've been around one that had passion, didn't we? He's fired up with passion. Thank God for uh, the difference that Jesus Christ makes in a person's life. Thank you, Texas Baptist, for allowing me to come. I am delighted to be here, and I consider it a real privilege. I don't know of anywhere I'd rather be than with a group of God's family and especially those that are uh, called to preach the gospel. I love preachers, spend most of my time with uh, my own type, and that is just being around preachers and love to talk about the things of God and what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing. If you have your Bibles, be finding your place in 1 Kings chapter 17. I believe Bruce said everything about Elijah, but I, I want to just reiterate what he said. Ditto some of the things that he mentioned. It is uh, good to be here and see so many friends. I'll tell you, heaven's going to be one more family reunion. Amen? The older you get, the more your friends are on that side. So they tell me, I wouldn't know yet, I'm not that old. But it's good to be able to come somewhere like this and see the Johnsons, which were active members of First Woodstock and served and encouraged me, and Alan Kirkendall, now a pastor here in this state, that uh, was one of my deacons. And uh, it's a blessing to see what God is doing in the family of God. If you live long enough, it seems like the Lord Jesus Christ lets you in a little bit on fruit that remains and helps you just to remember it's worth the journey. Amen? Uh, even on Monday, and this is exciting, I preached four times yesterday, got up extremely early and drove through that Atlanta traffic, and I'm telling you, I was the last person to board the airplane this morning. I got a few things confused at the airport and uh, didn't hardly make my flight. And so even with that in mind, I know we often say that if we resign, it's normally on Monday. Well, I just got good news for you. Bless God, this is not one of those Mondays. That's enough to be excited about. But uh, I want to speak to you out of a message that was inspired in this state by my brother Ray Tenpenny. And uh, we talked about a message, and then God burned it into my own soul, and I want to share it with you. And I want you to listen to this passage as I read it, and I'm going to talk to you about this subject. Or... You there. And I want you to notice four different occasions where we find that word there. And then we're going to talk about where there is. And before I read the text, let me just mention to you, there's four there's here and I'm in my fourth there. God saved me when I was 20 years old. Never owned a Bible. My wife got me one the next morning. And then about two years into my conversion experience, God called me to preach. And so I... Um, went off to college, and it was there that God placed me long before I was ready. If I'd had my way, thank God I didn't, I would have not been pastoring then, but almost immediately in the first semester, God placed me at Livonia Baptist Church in Gaffney, South Carolina, and listen to me carefully, that was my there. And by the way, I thank God for first things. Thank God for the first church. And by the way, I, just, I believe you just really, if you're ever going to cut your spiritual eye teeth right, it needs to be in that first church. Matter of fact, I believe most Cyrus preachers missed it in the first church. And, and if you ever thought about what they have to put up with, if we're brand new, hadn't been converted long, and it's our first church, Livonia Baptist Church called me a few years ago and said, do you remember we had a little tape recorder on the floor when you were here and we used to record all your sermons? And we've got all of them in the library. And nobody's listening to them. Do you want them? I said, Lord, no. I don't want them. That was part of their punishment to have to hear them. But I'll tell you, for three years, three months, and three weeks, Livonia Baptist Church, Gaffney, South Carolina, God put me there. And I just want to back up and say, there's no place to be like there. And I'll tell you, it's amazing what God will do in your heart if you know you're there. I believe the average preacher goes somewhere and the first trouble that comes, he's wondering... Am I there? And if you are there, listen to me, preacher. If you are there, let the blessed storms come. Nothing will keep you there like knowing this is there. My second church, I didn't want to leave. I can still remember crying, remember the car I was in. I've got it fixed in my mind, leaving that church, thinking I don't know why God's making me leave. And I went over to Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, pastored the closest church west of the seminary, and that was back in the other days. Do you know what I mean? It was before the transition at that seminary. 
And so that church had been affected by that school. <laughs> I stayed there 20 months, and someone may say, well, you think you missed it? No, I believe with all my heart. God led me there. God saved my best friend in life, Donald Pope there, called him to preach. He's at Town Creek Baptist Church in Aiken, South Carolina, saved Barrett, Billy Therrington. He's pastoring a church, led him and his wife to the Lord while I was there, and his wife died last week. She'll be waiting for me on the other side because... Then after, I like to tell people I served there. If you ever had a church like this, and still thank God for it, but you ever served somewhere for 10 years in two, in two years? So how long were you there? 10 years. How old were you when you went there? 26. When did you leave? 28. <laughs> thank God for them. Takes all kinds. I believe that God is preparing us for what God has prepared for us. I knew he must have had something great for me. <laughs> Well, anyway, moving right along, I left there and God called me back to my home church. Don't many people get to do that. I, think of this for a moment. The night God saved me, God was saving the next preacher. You didn't hear what I said. You'd have said amen if you'd have heard that. The night God saved me, God was called, saving the next preacher. I became the next preacher of that church. And then in 1986, God called me to Woodstock. Churches split, fired the pastor, fired the minister of music. Lost half of their congregation to the Methodist church across the street. The word on the street was that the Ichabod was on the church, that God's glory had departed. People made fun of the church. They made fun of me for being the pastor. But I was there. Preachers call me every now and then and say, you're in that Atlanta area. I'd love to live in the Atlanta area. And they'll tell me the type of church that they're looking for. And they say, if you know of one like that or, or find one like that, if you'd recommend me. And if you heard why, how they described that church, bless God, if I ever find one like that, I'm going to take it. <laughs> one of the worst things you can do is write a church off because it's in a mess. I hear preachers say, uh, they, they don't have any soul winners over there. They don't even have visitation. I'm not going there. That's why they need you. I don't normally get this excited on Monday in the introduction. But anyway, beginning, beginning in verse 1, I want you to look what the Bible says. And Elijah the Tishbite, the, of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel is before whom I stand, and that's who we stand before. Standing before men, the fear of man is a snare. You stand before God and he'll make you fearless. The Bible says, There shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. And by the way, he's hitting Balaam right in his major strength. Balaam was the God of fertility. He was the God of rain. He says, I want to tell you, my God wants to inform Israel. It's not going to rain. He went after his strength. The Bible says, then the word of the Lord came to him saying, get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook. By the way, that's interesting. Verse 3 tells him to hide. First, Corinth, first Kings 18, 1 Kings 18.1 tells him to show himself. I've been told that if you can discern when to hide and when to show yourself, you'll find yourself in the will of God. The problem with the average preacher is showing himself when God's told him to hide. And by the way, God hides you when he wants to prepare you. And if you try to show yourself before he hides you, you're not prepared what he's going to place you out there to stand before. That's a good word. Hide by the brook cherub which flows into the Jordan. It will be that you shall drink from the brook and I have commanded, as Brother Bruce showed us, uh, ravens to feed you there and to drink from the brook. Listen to what he did. And he says, and to feed you, there it is, there. I don't believe God would have fed him anywhere else. By the way, that's a commentary on Christianity. That's a commentary on the call of God. Well, you're somewhere and you just feel like, I don't know what it, what's wrong here. It, it must be these people. No, the real question is not is it the people. The question is, are you there? It don't matter if it's a valley of dry bones. If that's where God sent you, you preach to those bones. And sooner or later, the blessed wind will begin to blow. We just got to know that's where God told us to go. The Bible says in verse number 5, I love this, just simple compliance to the word and will of God. He went and did according to the word of the Lord, and that's what we ought to be doing. And he stayed by the brook Cherubeth, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. He was not an American, or they had to feed him three times a day. And it happened after a while. But the brook dried up because there was no rain there. Question I want to ask, can you be in the perfect 
smack dab center of the will of God and the brook dry up? Absolutely. He was exactly where God sent him when the brook dried up. Oftentimes, well, you know what we do as preachers? When the brook dries up, the resumes start flowing. Preacher, what do you recommend we do when the brook dries up? Stay there until the commander-in-chief tells you where your next assignment is. The Bible says in verse number 7, and it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain to land. You know, we quote that verse of the Lord Jesus over in the New Testament that he has caused it to rain on the just and the unjust. I want you to know that when judgment falls, it normally falls on the just and unjust also. The reason the brook's dried up, historians tell us that it's now been about a year since it's rained. Things are starting to dry up. And when it dries up, that pronouncement of doom and woe that he pronounced on that nation would also influence him as well. I've often said if God will send revival and the only way he's going to be able to do it in this materialistic nation is to bankrupt America, may I be the first to go break. Go ahead, bankrupt our church. But send revival. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I've come out in a window, the widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he came to her and said, Please bring me a little water and a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first. Bring it to me. Afterwards, make some for yourself and for your son. Think about that for a moment. Here's a poor little widow woman says, Oh, she's got enough for her child to have one meal and her to have one meal, and then they're going to die. And yet the man of God says, Well, I'll tell you what I want you to do. Why don't you just make the first cake for me? One of two things. Either this was one more self-centered prophet or he was serving a sovereign God. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the bend of flour should not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain. And she did. Went away and did according to the word of Elijah. Are you there? Well, I've took most of my time reading the scriptures. Let me just dive in, give you the message. There was, first of all, the place of God's purpose. It is seen in Elijah's position. As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand. Boldness comes from belief in the living God. There is a dearth in America of bold, courageous preaching. We had some people from a, a different denomination visiting our church last night and I spoke on, I was going to speak on 10 reasons that I'm a generous giver based on biblical perspective, a world view. And I only made it through three, and these people came up and said, I've been teaching Sunday school, been in church my whole life, never heard a message on giving from the pulpit. Because we've gone out and surveyed the people and asked them, uh, what do you want us to preach on? And the top three answers is always, don't talk about money. And so we're buying into it. Let me just say to you, sweet preacher, if you're not preaching what the Bible says on money and just reminding ourselves that there's 45 parables in the New Testament, 38 of them deal with our possessions. And when we realize that the number one, number two cause in America for divorce is financial issues, and the number one is communication, and my theory is they can't talk because they're mad about money. And then to think that I hold the word of life, Almighty God has given us insight on wealth, and I'm going to step here and be silent while my families are divided. Pray help me. And Elijah enjoyed a relationship with God and he dwelled in communion with him. He's conscious of being in God's presence. That's his position. But it's also his protection. God sent him over to the brook Cherubeth to protect him, but he also sent him there to prepare him. You see, God knew there was going to be a Carmel out there in his future. And I'm just going to be honest with you. From all I can read in the Word of God, you're not ready to see the firefall until you've spent some time over in lonely Cherubeth and you've obeyed God to go to Zarephath. What we want to do is graduate from seminary and go to Mount Carmel Baptist Church. Somebody says, well, God may want you out there at Cherubim. Nobody's out there in Cherubim. If God's out there, it's all that matters. Well, I don't know if I can make it or what they're going to pay me. If God sent you out there, he'll send the ravens. 
The liberals believed that the ravens were ravious, ravious people. They believed they were nomadic people that brought the food in. There's a Greek word for that, hogwash. I, I, listen, I believe with all my heart that God sharpens our skills and God gives an edge to our preaching when we allow God to send us to the cherubs of this world where the only way we can make it is for God to sovereignly, supernaturally meet every need we have. You know, it's something to be up there at Shelby, North Carolina, coming out of poverty, hadn't seen my dad in 13 years, and my wife informed me with our little 18-month-old Deanna that we're out of food and we don't have any money and our family is in poverty. My mother was living on welfare in Wilmington. And then there'd be a knock at the door and Shelly Ezel's wife says, I hope we didn't embarrass you, but we know y'all came to our church yesterday. And I can't explain this, but I was sitting around the house and I told my husband Shelly that God spoke to me and that I was supposed to get up some groceries and take over to Preacher Hunt's house. I'm telling you, God sends the ravens. I'll tell you, now when I stand and tell our people that God will supply the needs, I don't do it with some theoretical stuff that I read in the book. My mind begins to think back to those times God did it and what happens, chill bumps begin to climb my spine. They're waiting in line to sing hallelujah and I'm telling you, you can preach with passion and with fire. We've lost the ability to know the God that we're preaching. It was a place of God's purpose. So much more, but moving along quickly, keep us on time. There was a place of God's power. Now, the Lord gave me a different twist on this. I want you to listen to me carefully. There was a place of God's power. I found in this text that this place of power was, first of all, a place of dependence. When he sent him down to Cherubeth, he made him a dependent Baptist, not an independent. He was depending on the Lord. He was going to learn of God's faithfulness. He'd be able to go out after a while and preach on the faithfulness of God and somebody say, well, Elijah, how do you know God's going to come through? Because he sent the ravens, not once, but every day for over a year. He caused the brook to dry until he was through with me there. I remember when God first called me to preach. You know how long it take you to prepare your sermon when you were not preaching at a church yet? Ever how long you had to get to that church? If they said, don't you preach for me three months, it took three months. Can you imagine when you get your first church, you've been saved for less than three years? You've got your Bible. It was a good one, good Schofield reference edition. I had me a Matthew Henry single volume commentary. That was my library. And the church said, we want you to be our pastor. And I said, what does that mean? Said, you'll be preaching Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Now, pray tell me, how can you prepare three sermons in a week when it's taken three months to prepare one? Listen to me carefully. God feeds based on demand. If God wants you to preach 18 times, God will give you 18 sermons. God feeds based on demand. We're sitting back saying, I can't do this. I remember telling the Lord a few years ago I would do more, but my plate was full. And then he reminded me in my quiet time one morning, last time he checked, they weren't my plate. It's his plate. It's a place of dependence. God will get you, if you want to know the power of God, God will get you in a place of dependence. First Baptist Church Woodstock's in a place of dependence. We've decided to do one of the largest building programs in America, and we've chosen to do it out of the tithes. Because how much am I going to need next year to pay the payments on the building? They said $8 million. They said, raise the budget $8 million. We're on the edge. And you know, it ain't all bad. Y'all got quiet. But let me go a step further. God's, God's power is not just a place of dependence. Listen to this. Listen carefully. It's a place of dryness. Here's a good question. Why, why does God sometimes let our sources dry up? F.B. Meyer says he wants to teach us to not trust in his gifts but in himself. See, God takes most of us, if not all of us, through brook-drying experiences sometimes in our life. Can, can you think, I don't hope you can't even remember back, but many times in all our lives, we've just gone through what we call a, a brook drying experience. It provides an opportunity to grow in faith, to keep our eyes focused better on God, and who's the primary source of our supplies. You know, dryness can be a place, and normally is a place of solitude. Be still and know that I am God. C.H. McIntosh said, our time in training in secret must far exceed our time of acting in public. 
God in his power was preparing Elijah's heart. He did the same thing with Moses in a dry place, 40 years on the backside of the desert. David spent most of his time following sheep. It was dry. John the Baptist, time alone in the wilderness. Paul, the Arabian desert. John the Apostle, the Isle of Patmos. All the men God used, he put them in dry places. Every church I've ever gone to has been considerably smaller than the church I left. Been in four churches. Now, you didn't hear me say I, I always wanted to find a smaller church. I've never gone to a raise. You didn't hear me say I didn't want a raise. Seemed like every time our church got up and growing and blessed, God would move me to one a third the size, the one I left. Someone said, you know, that's not all bad, though. You go to a real good church, and then if it messes up, they'll say, he ain't much of a leader. You go to the churches like I've gone to, and they admire you for taking them. <laughs> and you can't hurt them. I mean, if they'd have fired me, they'd have said they fired the last preacher too. He split it. It ain't the first time. But let me tell you, it's also a place of provision. There is a place of God's provision. Hey, be careful that you don't allow your favorite verses and your favorite proverbs to become too commonplace. I've always heard it said, where God guides, God provides. That's a well-worn but gloriously true proverb. Said that God goes ahead of us and makes our arrangements. I want you to listen to me. I'm getting ready to share something. and I'll, I'll use it to kind of wrap it up. But I want, you, I want you to hear my statement again. God goes ahead of us and makes all the arrangements. I quit school because I was afraid to give a public book report. Remember, I didn't have a dad in my life from, since I was seven years old. My mom had to work two jobs, factory in daytime, waitress at night, to keep us afloat in the government project. Vance Hafner said that God is responsible for our upkeep when we follow his direction, but he's not responsible for any expense not included in his schedule. I want you to listen to this truth. You got your Bible sitting there in your lap? Look at verse number 9. God spoke to Elijah and said, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Siddam. Here it is, and dwell there. See, I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. Isn't it amazing what God uses to provide for us? You know what he's used to provide for Elijah? A brook, birds, and a widow. Every one of those speak of, of just dearth almost. But isn't it amazing? Listen to the story. Isn't it amazing that when God told Elijah to go to Zarephath, in the same breath he said, and I've commanded a widow to meet you there. There's more people that God's calling to go somewhere and do something, but they're telling God why they can't go. And what God hadn't let them in on yet is he's commanded somebody to take care of the need they're using for the excuse not to go. I wanted to go to college. How are you, you going to go to college when you're a high school dropout? took me three times. I'm feeling at home to, to pass the GED. So I finally passed the GED. I'm 23 years old. God's called me to preach. I'm timid and I'm shy. My wife laughs and she says, how are you going to talk? I mean, you give a five-minute testimony and cry and that you've never preached. How are you going to do this? My father-in-law's a CPA and he says, it's not making sense financially either. Nothing made sense. The only thing that made sense is I sensed that God had said, go. And so when I got over there, I'm thinking, how, how am I going to make ends meet? I mean, what am I going to do? When God commanded me, to move to Gaffney, he spoke to a little couple by the name of Otis and Viola Scruggs. Viola said, I prefer for you to call me Punk. That's my nickname. Now listen to their story. Forty-five years before I got there, they had twin boys born to them. This is an old farm couple, had money, precious couple. They said they used to pray and say, oh, God, We'd like to see both of them in ministry. In the name of Jesus, would you give us at least one preacher? Both of them, before they were two years old, died with kidney disease. He said, now I'm 70 years old. I'm winding it down, and all I ever wanted was a preacher. And here's what he said. I believe God wants me to adopt you. I said, I said what do you mean, adopt me? He said, well, I'll tell you what it'll mean. He said, I, I just want every week to give you some money. I want to buy you some clothes, buy your wife's clothes, your children, I want to pay you school. Did you know that when you're broke and somebody shakes your hand and there's money, did you know you can feel the difference? (laughs) 
for three years, three months, and three weeks. Every time Otis would come, he'd walk over and say, hey, preacher, I love you, and he'd shake my hand. And I, I knew what it was. And, and I'd, I'd just I'd say thank you, and I'd take it right back and put it into my pocket. And, and he'd, he'd, pay for, he'd call us and say, let's go out to eat, or I want to take you down here and buy you something. He taught me this principle. I wrote it in my book. I've never missed anything I've given away, is what he said. But has it ever dawned on you that those things you're worried about that need to be taken care of, that when God calls you to go, God commands somebody to meet you there. But if you stay here, you will never know, never know what God's got out there waiting on you. It's just a great, great biblical principle. God had it out there waiting for us. This is interesting. Did you catch it when I read the text? Do you know what they were doing when they got there? The woman was picking up sticks. Can I remind you what they were doing? When he left, they were raising the dead. The average Baptist church in the Southern Baptist Convention is spending most of its time picking up sticks when they're supposed to be in the business of raising the dead. By the way, you want to hear a leadership principle God showed me here? Look at your Bible, verse number 5. He went and did according to the word of the Lord. Look at verse 15. She went and did according to the word of Elijah. You know what Paul said about that leadership principle? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Follow me as I follow the Lord. Who's the woman following? She's following Elijah. He's the man of God. You know who our people are to follow? The man of God not an issue of anything other than biblical authority. It's a, it's a servant spirit. It's, I'm doing what God told me to do in the people. It's unbelievable to serve a church for the last 18 years that has split and run their pastor off and have never had a negative vote. That's a miracle of God. In fact, wait, hold on just a minute. I want to think about that and have a spell. Hold just a minute. That's unbelievable. Bible says that they uh, she prepared that meal for him and God promised them historians say you've got two and a half years to deal with listen to this and I'm through that until it rains again the flour bin will not go empty nor the curse of oil I, I, want, I love this study don't you I love, I love the study of my Bible what I wanted to do I wanted to see if anybody believed that what God may have done is fill the uh, barrel up. Because it's not hard to give when the barrel's full. But you know what scholarship believes? For the next two and a half years, every time this widow woman went to prepare a meal, it was the last flower. <laughs> You're not getting it. Some of you are going to get this at dinner, it's going to hit you, and you're going to throw your fork. Two and a half years. Here's the last, Elijah. Well, let's bless the Lord for it. Pour that last bed of oil in. Come back over that next afternoon. Two times for two and a half years. Bruce kept asking the question, where is the Elijah's? Where is the power of God? It's still out there waiting for people to be obedient. There's one statement God's put in my heart in recent days. It's a good statement to close on. God is looking for people that will allow him to be himself in them. He, he don't need your help, bless your heart. He just, he just wants somebody to say, just come on in me, Jesus, fill me up, and just be yourself, make yourself at home, dwell in me, that's what it means, to be at home in me. Just fill me up, overflow through me, and just have your way. And then I don't have to go out and try to make the message more palatable, I don't have to make it more culturally clean. All I've got to do is just lift him up. And as the song says, he's altogether worthy. He's altogether lovely. And we'll make him known. Are you there?